I'm Gareth Chafee and I'm a Senior Project Manager at Wessex Archaeology. So the house at Butser is based on the, the excavations at Kingsmead Quarry Horton. That site is just to the west of Heathrow Airport. It was a gravel extraction quarry run by Semex UK and we excavated on the site from 2003 to 2014. A few years ago I received an email um, from Butser um, suggesting they wanted to use some of the, the Horton houses um, as a basis for building a new structure. They had found our evidence online on our website and I think they, they thought that they were going to receive a plan and a photograph back. What actually happened was a, a true collaboration. We worked really closely together. We visited each other regularly um, and had this built this really lovely team collaboration um, to develop the, the site forward. At Kingsmead Quarry Horton, we actually found four early Neolithic houses. Um, and through discussions with Butts, we chose to construct the 2012 house, which we refer to as Horton II, simply because it was the largest structure and it was the most usable space for them as a, as a kind of charitable and educational um, entity. Uh, my name's Trevor Creighton, and my position is Projects Coordinator at Butts Ranch and Farm. In a normal year, when COVID-19 isn't about, we have about 35,000 school children. Um, and the numbers are again picking up now as the situation for us is improving. So we use it as a, as a classroom to some extent, but it's, it's a living classroom. Um, so it provides shelter for them, but it also in and of itself is educational. To sit in a building like this that effectively dates to the late Stone Age says more about the Stone Age to an eight-year-old child than any amount of reading out of books is going to do. Um, it's also used in the same way for the general public. So we have, again, in a normal year, we would have about 20,000 visitors from the general public and from universities and um, other places outside of the school environment. They'll take the same take home message, but it's also a space that we can use for meetings, for small events, and actually not so small, we can get about 70 people in, in here quite safely. So it's a multi, uh, it's a multi-function building. So I think some of the biggest challenges were we didn't know what this building would have looked like. So we found the archaeological evidence, which is basically some holes in the ground effectively. So one of the biggest challenges was to determine what this building could have actually looked like. And I think using the archaeological evidence and Butts' knowledge um, of constructing experimental buildings, we were able to kind of work together, collaborate together and come up with this structure that mirrored the archaeology as much as humanly possible. The ground plan of this house mirrors precisely the archaeology that was excavated. It's a sort of lozenge shape, a bit of a wobbly rectangle that's wider in the middle. So we have taken great pains to replicate that ground plan. We have had then to fill in a lot of gaps. There's no direct evidence about what the walls were like, or if it had walls, to be quite honest, or if it had a roof. However, what was found in the ground were, were substantial trenches that were filled with black material, which is effectively the remains of timber. It's possible that some of those walls had vertical timbers. Now, we were not able to confidently build a 15 metre by, by 7 metre house with vertical walls up to a height of a practical height of, let's say, two or two and a half metres with Neolithic tools that we were confident would be stable. That's a big house by the standards of 4,000 years later. Um, so we had some challenges in, in sort of fulfilling the archaeology that may have been there. So what we've done is we've actually built this house into the ground. It's effectively an A-frame and it doesn't have any walls at the side. You could say that that's something of a cop-out and the archaeology doesn't support what we've done, but it doesn't contradict it. So what we have done is made some low walls using horizontal timbers so that what we have, where there was timber in the ground, we have timber in the ground. But also to acknowledge the fact that perhaps this building did have walls with vertical planks, we have built the end wall with vertical planks. We've also built the other wall in a slightly different way and it has what's called a sill plate. So that's a horizontal um, beam of timber that's in the ground on top of which we built a wattle and daub wall, which is a sort of woven wood with mud on the top of it. So we have used three different possibilities 
of how this building might have been built in the first place. Um, that's important archaeologically because, again, when this building is demolished, we hope that we will get evidence um, that will either match or contradict the original archaeology. If it doesn't match, we go, well, it probably wasn't that. But if we get one of these walls that gives the same sort of clues that the original archaeology um, gave us, then that really firms up the case that, that that's how it was done. The other thing it allows us to do in a public archaeology terms is say, well, archaeologists never know. There'd be no point in studying archaeology if you knew what you were dealing with. And we can use this as a way of interpreting it. Say, we don't know. These are three different ways. What do you think? So actually, we, we think this kind of almost a tasting menu of wall types is really important, both experimentally and in terms of pu public archaeology. We've put in a few more A-frames to make the building safe and to make it to 21st century standards, if you like. Um, the other important element was that the house um, archaeologically didn't have any supporting structures, so supporting uh, posts, no internal post holes. So that was a ch real challenge to come up with a structure that had uh, no other internal support, hence the A-frames. The other elements we mimicked were the, the slightly tapering end on the eastern end. The result of this, by maintaining a 50 degree angle um, for the roof, the uh, result of this, we ended up with a hogback roof, which is really, really pronounced, uh, particularly when it was at a skeletal phase. Very, very obvious. Um, and we think that we may have stumbled across that um, because it's actually there from a, a strengthening point of view. I think the other elements that we were able to replicate were the the entrance on the southwest eastern corner, we um, represented that really well. One of the key things that's been learned about this is the scale and ambition of Neolithic builders. It's been quite a challenge for us to build it in terms of engineering the structure, but we've used either Neolithic tools uh, or a kind of modern um, version of those. So axes, simple drills, in our case, bone drills, that sort of thing, um, to, to basically demonstrate that, that a Neolithic person with a Neolithic toolkit can build a structure of this size. So the first thing that's been learned is just the scale and ambition of Neolithic builders. The rest of the learning is going to come on later down the, down the track. In fact, Often with, uh, with uh, experimental buildings, most of the learning comes when the building's demolished. So what we hope to find then is what similarities uh, in the ground. So the archaeology of this building, what does it look like relative to what the original archaeology looked like? Some of the other interesting things were that um, we had a great little team of people with um, shared interest in building this house. and. There was a little bit of uh, similarity between us and what we imagine an, a Neolithic community like uh, would be like. So there was this uh, incredible sense of community and the pace of working was quite slow because we weren't using mechanical tools. Um, but after a time, you became used to that. that. That became quite familiar and the stress of time was removed. Of course, COVID helped remove some of that, but I can't say that you can get into the mind of the prehistoric builder, but there's a possibility that you get some insight into the different experience of time. When you're not under time pressure, as so often in the 21st century we are, we are it reminds you that, that time is, is quite relative. Um, that was a really interesting part of it. I think the other thing that we learned was the value of collaborating with uh, field archaeologists, with Wessex archaeology, the people who excavated it, because then you have a mutual feedback process. And, we learned a lot from that, but I think the value of that's actually going to come down, downstream. So what we hope with experimental building is that what we learn through the process of building it then can be fed back into field archaeology and maybe give some new insights into to what you're looking at. Because what's left from a, a Stone Age building or an Iron Age building is very little in this part of the world, just stains in the ground. So actually trying to determine what that represents in, in terms of the original structure is quite difficult. So we hope that through building this house, there might be little fragments of information that will just help field archaeologists with that really difficult task of interpretation. In terms of materials, um, we have used around about four tonnes of timber, which is Scots pine, available in the Neolithic. 
we've used around about five to six tonnes of thatch um, and some other sundry items as well. So our roof alone puts about eight tonnes of load onto the frame. And we've used pretty much five kilometres of string, twine and rope. So we're talking about some pretty enormous figures there. Um, in terms of human hours, it's really difficult to, to estimate, but I would say probably two to 3,000 person hours to do it. We had a core team of staff and volunteers, which uh, outside of the COVID lockdown period was probably about four to five staff with another four to five volunteers who were working on that um, reasonably constantly. But we also had a, a team of probably 20 other volunteers, uh, some of whom came for a couple of days, some of whom, as with Wessex staff, were often just here for a day. Um, so it's quite a big team when you look at it. There would have been 40 or 50 people in total who'd, who'd worked on this house. One of the things that we learned from the, the sheer quantity of materials um, that we used is that it raises questions about what I'd call resource economy of the Neolithic, general prehistoric resource economy. So what did they use this material? Did they use this much material? Did they use five kilometres of twine? Did they use five tonnes of timber and six tonnes of thatch or five tonnes of thatch? Was that possible for them? I don't know, maybe that's impractical. On the other hand, if we look at a building like this, look at the scale and, and look at the volume of materials, might that give us information about why a house was sited somewhere? So this house, for example, or the, the original structure, we don't know it was a house, but the original structure was sited near a wetland. So it was really on a small island surrounded by a, a marshy, uh, marshy reeds. The question could be asked, did they site it there because they had ready access to building materials like reed for thatching, which is what we've thatched this here, with here. So we can't answer questions about the resources that were used in building this, this house. But what we can do is pose a series of questions by saying, we had to use a lot of stuff to build this house. Is that important relative to where this house is found? So really interesting thing, when, that's why we tabulate the amount of material that we use, because it, it tells us the scale of what's being built. And in this case, by Neolithic standards, it's vast. So I think experimental archaeology is hugely important. We talked about it during the construction phase and also the design phase. We could have come up with 10, 12 different structures, which also mimic the archaeology, and that was using Butts's experience and their, their knowledge of how, how to create these things that we kind of stumbled across and kind of went with the, the structure that we've ended up with. But I think that was part of the design process. What's really important is we've created something that it could have looked like this, as opposed to it did look like this, because we've shown and we've seen it through our designs that we could have come up with multiple different versions of the house. I think experimental archaeology remains very important to um, archaeology as a discipline um, because we will never understand the past fully. However, if we don't attempt to recreate aspects of that past, we don't understand the fabric and the look of the past, and we don't, I think, get a full insight or a clear picture of the ambition uh, and the skills of, of long dead people. It was really important to me when I became involved in the project to get Wessex staff involved. Um, our work at Kingsmead Quarry uh, went on for numerous years and there were a core group of staff who worked on the site, probably as much as I did, if not more. So it was really important for me personally for them to be involved. So Andy Sol, for instance, was involved in helping with the design and his wonderful um, model structure actually influenced the design of the build as well. And that was really important because he actually excavated the house in 2012. Um, we were also able to offer wellbeing days to some of our staff. So that was incredibly useful for them um, to have a day out of the office. Um, Non-archaeologists as well as archaeologists, so like finance teams uh, were going out, um, heritage specialists would go out for the, for the day and actually help and be involved in the construction. Butts is an incredible place, and it's an incredible place to visit anyway, but to be in part involved for something like that for the day is just hugely beneficial to their well-being. Wessex and Butts are 
have really close ties. You know, the the potential for collaboration is is vast. With the, you know, we have a lot of shared ideals, um, and the friendships that we've built is is going to kind of see us through for many years. I'm sure. Probably the most significant component of this relationship is the enthusiasm. The enthusiasm from Gareth and then the enthusiasm from really the entire team, top to bottom, bottom to top at Wessex Archaeology. So that enthusiasm gave us motivation and also we were able to engage in a dialogue. What might this house have been? What, how do we interpret that archaeology? Is this possible or do you think it's impossible? Because Gareth and people like Andy Soule actually excavated this house. So they were boots on the ground. They saw it in the ground. We saw it in photographs. So we were able to engage in a dialogue and agree this is possible, this is possible. That's probably not possible. Um, that combination of archaeological expertise and insight combined with this incredible enthusiasm has created what I think is a very unusual project because it's collaboration between the excavators and the experimentalists. Um, but the sheer enthusiasm was also a fantastic impetus and an inspiration for us to feel that we had the support of the excavators. Um, the next thing was that there was material support as well. So we had a lot of volunteers coming over from Wessex to do work on this building. Um, in fact, there was, I believe, a competition. The winners of the competition um, got to come over here for a day. Uh, so it was, a really, it was a really great collaboration in terms of archaeology, in terms of just the enthusiasm and also the material contribution of Wessex. And I, I think it's a model. I think it's a perfect model for experiment, experimental archaeology because then Experimental archaeologists are not working in isolation. Field archaeologists are not working in isolation. The whole point of experimental archaeology is to inform field archaeology. If you're working together as a team, it's perfect. To experience that journey from that moment of receiving an email suggesting that someone wanted to create the archaeology that I found and I excavated was, was massive. And to see that through the whole com completion um, has been great. I've also made many personal friends at Butzer, which is which is great for me as well. I just didn't kind of foresee any of that um, emotionally as well. Just being in that building, just I'd never lose that, and it was really fun on on that the reveal, if you like, because my family were there as well. I was able to show my children for the first time. They've lived and breathed the experience through photos and me constantly talking about Butzer. So it was the first time that they were actually able to step inside the building. So that was really big for me as well. Um, I was part of a team and yet, you know, I still feel an enormous amount of personal pride as I think everyone who is involved with this building should do and I suspect they do. Um, as we don't have any experience as, as builders, to have created a structure that is 15 and a half metres long, seven and a half metres wide and just over five metres high and have that still standing and have that impressing visitors, be they general public or other archaeologists, it's a source of enormous pride. And because this building then articulates, um, I think, a lot about the, the ambition and capability of, of people in the, the late Stone Age, then as an archaeologist, that is also deeply satisfying to me because that's, you know, that's my job in essence, is to say to people, this is what people in the past could do. Thank you.